The Athanasian Creed is the third of the ancient creeds that the Lutherans of the 16th century adopted as a basic standard of faith, a basic expression of what we believe about, about our God. Did St. Athanasius write the Athanasian Creed? Well, you might say that if he didn't, he probably should have. <laughs> uh, no, in point of fact, he did not. Uh, the Athanasian Creed appears for the first time in the early 6th century, mm -hmm. uh, almost a couple hundred years after Athanasius lived. But it was given the title Athanasian Creed because Athanasius' name had become synonymous with orthodoxy. And this creed, in some ways being the lengthiest and least well known, is at the same time a wonderful summary of the orthodox faith of the early church from the uh, first through the fifth centuries. Does it say something different than the Apostles and Nicene Creed? I'd have to say yes and no. Uh, when it comes to the topic of the Trinity, no. In fact, the Athanasian Creed is divided into two parts. In the first half, it deals with the topic of the Trinity and summarizes the debates regarding the relationship of the Father, Son, Spirit uh, that had taken place in the third, fourth century. And so it takes a position over against Arius and over against the Modalists. In the second half of the creed, however, it takes up issues that arose in the fifth century. In other words, here's kind of what happened. The Nicene Creed really takes up the issue of who is Jesus Christ, and focuses primarily on answering that question by talking about his relationship to the Father. So it explores the divinity of Christ, or confesses his deity, uh, that uh, Jesus is the only begotten Son of God. So what does it mean for him to be God? After that question had been settled, other questions began to arise now, like what does it mean when we say the Son of God became man. Now, what does it mean that he was a man? Is it a half human being? Is he a complete human being? A genuine human being? And so particularly with the Council of Ephesus in 431 and later with the Council of Chalcedon in 451, they dealt with that topic. So you could say the Athanasian Creed deals with both. The relationship of the Son to the Father, that is, in what way is the Son God? And in the second half of the creed, it deals with the question, in what way is the Son of God also a human being? Some of my students are struck by the fact that the Athanasian Creed begins on what almost seems to some like a harsh tone. Yeah, it actually says that whoever does not worship and hold to the Catholic faith as expressed here shall not be saved eternally. And... That's a very different tone than we live with in our modern age when people would like to talk about, well, in my perspective or in my opinion, there is a strong conviction, a sense of confidence. At the same time, some will raise the question, well, is the creed sort of saying that if I believe this intellectually, all these formulations, you know, is that what it means to be saved? And I would say no. You need to recognize that while the first line of the creed opens with the words, that one has to hold to this faith. It doesn't mean intellectually. It means more in the sense that one treasures them, that one takes them to heart, that these belong to the very identity of us as Christians. And then in the second and third line, it goes on to say we worship mm -hmm. the unity and trinity and the trinity and unity so that there is a connection between what I hold to is what I worship. So it's more of a practical dimension and not simply an intellectual activity. And it's quite clear that we're not worshiping the ideas or the conceptualizations. We're worshiping that person That's who is right. this three in one. I'm worshiping one God as three persons, three persons as one God. Does the the God that we're confessing as this this person, is, is that expressed in pretty much the same way that, that uh, the Nicene Creed expressed this trust in this person? I would have to say again, yes and no. Uh, in one sense, it uses the same kind of biblical language as the Apostles and Nicene Creed. It uses a lot of the same language, but it expresses that language in what I might say a different kind of grammar. Where the Apostles' Creed and the Nicene Creed focus on the narrative, 
the story uh, that the Son of God is the only begotten Son of the Father. He becomes a man. The Athanasian Creed provides what I might call grammatical rules for how we talk about God in a way that's faithful to the Bible. Mm -hmm. And it lays down two very simple grammatical rules. The first is, however you talk about God, don't talk about God as if there are three gods, mm -hmm. because we only confess one God. The second rule is this. However you talk about Father, Son, Holy Spirit, don't talk as if there was only one person and no distinction between Father, Son, mm -hmm. and Holy Spirit. Mm -hmm. So the first principle is directed against Arius, which would have given us two gods, mm -hmm. if not three. The other is directed against the modalists. Remember when I talked about how one god appeared as three different characters in a three-act play? So here are the two boundaries. Talk about God in such a way that you don't give the impression we worship three gods. And talk about Father, Son, Holy Spirit in a way that does not give the impression that the Father is the Son, the Son is the Father, and there's no distinction between them. The Creed then goes on to give you examples of how this is done. Mm -hmm. So, for example, it affirms, first of all, there is one God, not three gods. And it does this, by the way, by way of speaking of three titles for God. So it emphasizes the Father is God, the Son is God, the Spirit is God, but there aren't three gods, one God. Then it takes the next divine title, Lord. The Father is Lord, the Son is Lord, the Spirit is Lord, but there aren't three lords, there's only one Lord. The third title is Almighty. Now that might sound like an attribute, but in the early church, Almighty actually referred to more of a title that God is the all-ruling one. You could say God has the whole world in his hands. Uh, the Greek was Pantocrator, the all-ruling, all-governing one. So the Father is Almighty, the Son is Almighty, the Spirit is Almighty, but there are not three Almighties. So there's really nothing very complicated about it at all. It's not trying to explain the mystery of the Trinity. It's not trying to unpack it. It's simply trying to give us language of how to talk. Mm -hmm. So Father, Son, Spirit, each God, but don't talk as if there are three gods. There's only one God. Now the creed proceeds to ask the question, how do we talk about Father, Son, Spirit so that there's not one person, but that these are three individual persons? I hesitate to use the word individual because while they're distinct from one another, they're not separated from one another. And uh, it's a challenge to find sometimes the right language. Well, in order to explore this or to confess this, the Athanasian Creed simply says, here's how you distinguish them. The Father is uncreated and unbegotten. The Son, however, while being uncreated, the Son is begotten. So in some way, begot, being begotten distinguishes the Son from the Father. Even though it's a mystery that we can't explain exactly. or understand. And they don't try to explain it. Mm -hmm. Similarly, the Spirit is not created, but the Spirit is not begotten. Instead, the Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son. Now, if you were to ask me the question, what's the difference between the Son being begotten and the Spirit proceeding, I have no clue. And the Creed doesn't try to answer that. All we know is that somehow, in some way, the word begotten distinguishes the Son from the Father and the Spirit, and the word proceeding distinguishes the Spirit from the Father and the Son. Because the biblical usage of that term proceeding in John 14, for example, talks about the Holy Spirit proceeding from God, the Father, to us. And this really refers to some distinctive something within the Trinity, not outside the Trinity. Yes. Uh, these three words do not describe the Trinity's relationship to us. Unlike the Apostles' Creed, when you say the Father creates, the Son redeems, the Spirit sanctifies, those verbs have to do with us. 
I'm created, I'm redeemed, I'm sanctified. These verbs have to do with how Father, Son, and Spirit relate to each other. Is that something to do with those terms that you hear sometimes, the imminent trinity and the economic trinity? I wasn't sure if you wanted to get into that or not, but since you opened that door, I'm going to rush right through. <laughs> Tell us a little Absolutely. bit. Absolutely. Uh, theologians sometimes will distinguish between what we might call economic language for the trinity versus imminent. Economic comes from the Greek word in Acts, or economia, and it refers to how God has structured his relationship to us in this world, or how God has arranged salvation. So we normally think of the Father as the one who creates, mm -hmm. the Son as the one who redeems, the Spirit as the one who sanctifies. There is an economy, a structure, an order to how God expresses or manifests himself in our world. To speak of the imminent trinity is to speak of a language that talks about how Father, Son, Spirit relate to each other with no reference to us. Mm -hmm. That is, it's um, language or these are relations that are imminent within the trinity and really don't deal with how the trinity is manifested or how the trinity carries out the work of creation, redemption, and sanctification. Now, both are important. Mm -hmm. I think the economic language is sort of the way the Bible talks. It's the language of proclamation. This other language is very important, however, so that we keep in the back of our minds as we talk about the Father sending the Son or the Son obeying, that we have in the back of our minds that doesn't mean the Son is less of a God mm -hmm. than the Father. And the Son is the one who came as our Savior. And the creed goes on, it's necessary for eternal salvation that one also faithfully believe the incarnation of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's the second part of the creed. And so now they're going to explore what does it mean for Jesus or for the Son of God to become a human being. Mm -hmm. And there were questions, for example, uh, did he simply assume or take on a human body but not a human soul? Ah. You know, did the Son of God provide the soul for the body? But there were others who said, well, if that's the case, then the Son of God only redeemed or saved our body and not our soul or not our mind. He wasn't a complete human being then. Exactly. So that's why at the very beginning of that section, the Creed affirms that uh, the Son of God is true God with respect to his deity. But he's also a true man with a body and a rational soul <laughs> that is a complete human being so that we can affirm that the Son of God redeemed the total human being. And then comes the question, what's the relationship between the, the humanity and the divinity? And that will be the question faced in the fifth century. For example, when Jesus takes on a human nature, uh, does it mean it's a kind of relationship of a marriage between a husband and wife? They're, uh, connected together, they're associated together, but they're also distinct and separate. Uh, others said, well, no, maybe when the Son of God took on a, uh, became a human being, he transformed uh, the human nature into something else. Um, and so by the time you get to the Council of Chalcedon in 451, the Council is going to affirm, no, the Son of God who became a human being is 100% God, 100% man, and inseparable unity is formed between those two. And yet they continue to be distinct, the humanity and the, and the divinity, even though they're in just one person. That's right. The way that I like to explain this in, in the classroom is that Nestorius, he was the, the first that raised the issue, explained the relationship by, well, we often say, by suggesting that the two natures lie alongside each other like two boards. So you have the divinity and you have the humanity and they're distinct, you can tell which is which, and they're separable, you can take them apart. Then came a man named Eutychus, this is harder to illustrate, but he said the divine nature is so much more powerful than the human nature that it just swallows it up. So when the two come together, 
they, as Chuck just said, they, they merge in such a way that the human nature is swallowed up by the divine nature. And what the Council of Chalcedon teaches is that the almighty, the all-powerful divine nature comes together with the totally weak human nature, and they come together in a unity, a personal or hypostatic, the technical term, a personal union in which you can tell which hand is which. This is the, the right hand, this is the left hand. You can tell which fingers are which. They are distinct, but they are inseparable. And so if I hit someone over the head, even though my left arm is totally weak and, and unable to do anything, because the two share their characteristics, the technical term was communication of attributes, because they share their characteristics, my fist, two hands in one fist, um, have the, the impact that is shared by both the, the impotent left arm and the strong right arm. That's an imperfect analogy, I think. It's pretty good, though. And so this is the faith that the authors of the Athanasian Creed commended to the church, sang in the church as a kind of hymn. It's the faith that was sung throughout the Middle Ages, was confessed throughout the Middle Ages, and therefore could form the very basis of the confession of faith in the 16th century when Lutherans were called on to explain what they were teaching, what they believed, what they wanted to confess.